So Thomas Shubatum sent me a, an email linking to an interview. Uh, Thomas Shubatum was often on uh, the super chat, on the chat and super chat, who is a conductor, um, a conductor in the Bay Area and a cellist, a uh, really good cellist. Uh, and Thomas sent me this interview with a pianist, a very, very well-known, uh, one of the best pianists of his generation, certainly, um, uh, by the name of, uh, I'm going to butcher the name, Evgeny Kissin, Evgeny Kissin, Russian pianist, born in Russia, trained in Russia, got his musical breakthroughs in Russia, uh, uh, his first concerts as a teenager were with the uh, with orchestras in Moscow. So this is a, this is a Russian trained pianist, but one of the greats, at least of this generation trained in, you know, if you go back and you think of all the great pianists in history, many of them, a, a significant majority of them, I think were Russian. Russia has certainly in the, in the 20th century, Russia's had this amazing program of teaching piano, uh, that has just been stunning and has generated uh, from, uh, you know, Vladimir Horowitz to Arthur Rubinstein, I think Rubinstein was a Russian, uh, to many, many, many other great Russian pianists. And, and if Jenny Kissin is in that tradition. Anyway, if Jenny Kissin is doing a concert in Canada, and before the concert, he was interviewed about music and about the concert and about everything else. And as part of the interview, uh, he was asked about Ukraine. One of the policies that this Canadian, I, I can't remember if it's Toronto or Vancouver, but, but one of the policies that this, um, uh, that this Canadian orchestra has is they won't right now invite a Russian to play with them unless the Russian has spoken out against the war. So if the Russian stays silent or is pro the war, this Russian orchestra will not invite them to come and, and play. So uh, they asked Evgeny if he would be willing to make a comment on, um, on Russia and on the war with Ukraine. And Evgeny jumped at the opportunity and actually wrote a substantial essay about Russia, about some Russian history, going back to the Soviet Union, which he grew up under, and about the attitude of the West towards Russia. And I have to say it's rare that I read something and the attitude of the person writing it is the right attitude. <laughs> the details might we might not agree on every single detail. But the attitude is so in line that I said, I got to read this to you guys and, and comment on it because it's so good. It's just so good. And again, it's not the philosophical aspect, although it's strong philosophically, I think. It's the sense of life attitude that he projects here. Um, Evgeny is, became, became an Israeli citizen uh, I think he's got one other citizenship and he lives today in Prague. Uh, so he's not in danger uh, of, uh, of Putin, hopefully, although Putin has murdered people outside of Russia, but he's not in Russia. He's probably not going to go back to Russia anytime soon, given what he wrote. But it truly is an extraordinary statement. Uh, I encourage you, I'll read it, but I encourage you to go and find it and read it for yourself uh, because of how powerful it is. And, and let me, before I finish this, let me just say, uh, I was at a concert last night in London and the violinist was Ukrainian, also lives in Israel, Israeli citizen, uh, travels the world and, and plays the violin, uh, gave an extraordinary performance. I don't think the orchestra was very good, the Philharmonia Orchestra uh, in London, but he was very good, I thought, of Brahms' violin concerto, a concerto I highly recommend to all of you. But afterwards, he was, you know, he gave an encore. Uh, he was called back on stage and gave an encore. And he played this beautiful, very, very, very sad piece by some Ukrainian composer. I don't know who it was, and I was not familiar with the piece. It was, it was a piece new to me, but very sad, very moving, very touching. And he said something about Ukraine and about the war. So 
musicians standing up against this war, against Russian aggression. Good thing. Thumbs up. So let me read it to you. Now it's long, so be patient with me. And it starts off with some discussion of something out of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, out of Solzhenitsyn's novel. Really, it's a quote from Solzhenitsyn's novel, so it's a quote within a quote. I think the Solzhenitsyn novel brings out something very important that I think is also worth you thinking about me commenting on. So I'm going to read the whole thing. Again, it's Evgeny Kissin. Um, it was published recently. You can probably find it online and you can read along. Um, but, but hopefully you have the patience for this. I, I think it's worth it um, just to see that there are people out there, Russians out there, people raised in Russia who get it, who get it, who not just get Russia, but get the West, get the corruption of the West, get the decadence of the West, get the weakness of the West. And I titled this episode, Russia, the monster the West created, because that's exactly what he describes. He describes how the West created the monster we have today. And he goes further back than I did. So kudos to Evgeny. But we will start with a quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. So this is uh, Evgeny Kissin uh, in his essay. <clears throat> I'll start with a quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn's novel. And if you haven't read Solzhenitsyn, I don't know if you have the patience, but but I read him in the in the seventies, uh, and it was very powerful stuff, particularly super anti, um, super super anti uh, communism, anti Soviet Union stuff. He's a bit of a mystic, and certainly uh, certainly more conservative than uh, free market. It turned out, but his his novels depicting life in the Soviet Union are very powerful. Anyway, this is a quote from the novel in the first circle. The end of the chapter called Spiridon's Criteria, and I'm butchering the name, so I apologize for that. The story of the novel takes place in so-called Sharashka, a special place in the outskirts of Moscow, where technically qualified political prisoners, this is under the Soviets, were working on various projects for the government in Stalin's time, and where Solzhenitsyn himself spent a few years. One of the main characters of the novel, the young prisoner Gleb Nezin, whose prototype was the author himself, is going through a period of soul-searching and becomes close to another prisoner, an old peasant by the name of Spiridon. Finally, Nezrin expresses to Spiridon his thoughts and doubts and ends with the following question. And now he's going to quote the question and the continuation almost until the end of the chapter. Quote, Can anybody on earth possibly make out who's right and who's wrong. Who can tell us that? Spiridon's frown had disappeared, and he answered as readily as if he'd been asked which god would be in duty next morning. I can tell you, killing wolves is right. Eating people is wrong. What? What's that you say? The simplicity and certainty of Spiridon's Aster answer took Nezin's breath away. Just that, Spiridon said. The wolf killer is in the right. The man-eater is not. Gleb's face felt warm, uh, felt warm breath from under that mustache as Spiridon leaned close to whisper. Gleb, if somebody told me right now there was a plane on the way with an atom bomb on board. Do you want it to bury you like a dog here under the stairs, wipe out your family and a million other people? Only old daddy whiskers and their whole setup will be pulled up by the roots so that our people won't have to suffer anymore in prison camps and collective farms and logging teams. Spurred and braced himself, pressing his tense shoulders against the stairs as though they threatened to collapse on him, with the roof itself and all Moscow to follow. Believe me, Gleb, I'd say, I can't take it anymore. I've run out of patience. And I'd say, he looked up at the imaginary bomber, I'd say, come on then, get on with it, drop the thing. Now, 
I, before I continue reading um, Eugenie Kess, uh, uh, Kissin's um, rest of his article, just uh, the rest relates to this, but it's not it's not directly. What is he saying here? The character is basically saying life is so bad under communism. These camps, the lack of freedom, what our families have to go through, that I'm willing to die. I want somebody to drop an atom bomb on Moscow so that it ends. So that at least people outside of Moscow and future generations can live under freedom. Now, that is the attitude of a true freedom fighter. If you think about the, the underground in France under German occupation, they often encouraged the West to bomb even though they knew they were putting their own lives at risk. If you think about freedom fighters throughout history, putting their life on the line for what? knowing that they would probably not to live to see freedom, but knowing that life under slavery was not worth living, knowing that freedom was a cause worth fighting for, worth risking life for. See, as Solzhenitsyn in communist Russia, expressing the, simple, the, the, the idea that for us Russians, it's better that you drop the bomb. It's better that you drop the bomb. It's better that you end this horror that is the Soviet Union. That kind of moral certainty in the evil of the regime you live with is maybe only possible for the people, not only possible, maybe is only prevalent among the people who actually live in that regime. Because on the outside, people don't. And this is what Kissin writes in continuation. He says, I understand it and may be surprising and even shocking for many pacifist Westerners. But at the time when millions of useful idiots in the West were demonstrating for disarmament of their own countries in the face of the communist monster, believing that the Americans and the free world in general were at least as bad as the Soviets, if not even worse, I'll note that people like Murray Rothbard fall into that camp, believing that the American, America and the free world in general were at least as bad as the Soviets, it's not even worse. At that very time, we in the evil empire, behind the Iron Curtain, were secretly reading the above lines in some Samivdat. We remember Spidant's criteria to this day. And it has always been clear as daylight to us who the wolf killers were and who the man eaters were in the world. Not so, not so long ago, I learned, this is Kissing, that Winston Churchill, after the victory of the Nazi Germany, wanted to do exactly what Solzhenitsyn and other prisoners of the Gulag were dreaming of at that time, to drop an atomic bomb on Moscow and Kiev and to invade the USSR in order to liberate 200 million of its people and save the world from the red threat. But everybody else, the other Western leaders, as well as Churchill's own military, were against it. As a result, more than 100 million people were killed, not only in the Soviet Union and other communist countries, but also in the rest of the world because... As we now know, the Kremlin bandits during dozens of years were supporting terrorism on the entire planet, even in Africa and South America. Here's a Russian. I'll, I'll, I'll put side comments once in a while. Here's a Russian saying, you should have taken out the communists in 1945 when you had a chance. Many Russians would have died. Using a nuke would have destroyed some major cities. But the world would have been a freer place. Fewer people would have died ultimately. I mean, think about the courage to write that. The courage to write that today. 
the courage to express such a view, and the courage that we see so little of in the West today, of calling, of calling communism uh, the evil empire, calling communism responsible for over 100 million deaths. This is a Russian writing and expressing these ideas when so many of us, so many people in the West, oh, communism, that noble ideal, ooh, America, America, the imperialist, America, America built on slaves, America, the evil country. No, with all its flaws, with all its problems, with all its challenges, America is a shining beacon of goodness as compared to a country like the Soviet Union. Kissin understands that. We do not. And sadly, many of our libertarian friends and quotes certainly don't. That's why many of them are supporting Russia right now. Kissin goes on. Later, if the West had not pursued the disgraceful and suicidal po policy of detente, the evil empire would have collapsed much earlier and millions of human lives all over the world would have been saved. I don't know. I have a feeling, and, and maybe somebody can get to Kissin and ask him, but I have a feeling that, that Kissin is reading Ayn Rand because that's exactly what Ayn Rand said. That it was... that. Soviet Union would have collapsed if not for the tent. If not for the compromising West, for the weak West, for the negotiating West, we started sending wheat to the Russians during the 1960s and 70s. Let them starve. Let them suffer the consequences of their own actions. Maybe the regime would have fallen a decade or two earlier I agree completely with Kissin that it would have. Ayn Rand agreed with Kissin that it would have. I mean, he agrees with her because she wrote it much before he did. Ayn Rand always thought that we had nothing to fear from communism because it would implode. It would self-destruct. It would go away. It was a failure and it would never be successful. And she was absolutely right. So he's going back to World War II. We could have gotten rid of the Soviets. We didn't. The West was weak. Then we negotiated with the Soviets. We gave them food. We engaged in a taunt. The West was weak, emboldened them. Millions of people died as a consequence. He continues. I'm saying all this because it's perfectly clear to me and other people of my circle. If the West had applied the same sanctions against Putin's regime it is, as it is applying now, eight years ago, after the annexation of Crimea, there would have been no war in the Ukraine, in Ukraine now. I'll tell you even more. Had the West applied such sanctions in 2008 in response to Putin's invasion of Georgia and the de facto annexation of South Oss Ossetia, Putin would not have annexed Crimea five and a half years later. And maybe by the time he would, have, he would be no longer in power and more. If the West had applied some sanctions back in 1999-2000 in response to the genocide in Chechnya, there would definitely have been no invasion of Georgia and Ukraine. So note that what he understands, Kissin understands, and what almost nobody else understands is the extent to which the West, in its weakness, in its pretense of moral equivalency, in its meekness, has emboldened the Russians, have emboldened the fascist regime of Vladimir Putin to ever more and greater military adventures, to ever more and greater violations of the rights of its neighbors. Kiss it again. In a speech that was broadcast on Russian TV just before the invasion of, the, of Ukraine, Putin claimed that the West had been very unfair towards Russia, quote, even under the extreme openness of Russia in the 1990s. That statement did not surprise me because I know very well who Putin is and what one should expect from him. However, what does surprise me a lot 
is that there are people in the West, some on this chat, there are people in the West, I uh, once said, ah, I lost my place, that there are people in the West, people of firm democratic convictions, who share this view, that the West behave too much like the winner of the Cold War. For me, and this is so cool, for me and my friends, the exact opposite is the obvious. The West did not behave like the winner of the Cold War. And that's why we are having all these problems and tragedies now. After the Soviet Union ceased to exist, why on earth did Russia inherit its seat in the UN Security Council? I understand that after World War II, it was probably difficult to avoid giving that seat to the Soviet Union. I disagree with that. I don't think there should be a, a, a UN or, or uh, the Soviet Union should have never been in the UN Security Council. But okay. But why was it given to Russia after the evil empire collapsed? It should have been given to a deserving democratic country, like, for example, Canada or Australia or Japan. And now we all see what problems are arising from it. After the fall of communism, the West should have done to Russia what it did to Germany after the fall of Nazism. Communist leaders should have been tried by an international tribunal. The West should have forced Russia to outlaw the communist ideology, literature, and symbols to build dozens of memorials to the victims of communism, to repent constantly, and to pay reparations to the numerous victims of the Kremlin bandits, Jews, Ukrainians, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Georgians, Poles, Czechs, and many others. The fifth columns in Ukraine and the Baltic states should have been transferred to Russia in the same way as the Germans of Sudentland and Silesia were transferred to Germany after World War II. The West didn't do any of that. In other words, it didn't penalize Russia, Russia for the Soviet Union. And the post-communist Russia, under the ex-secretary of, of, of a regional committee of the CPSU, Boris Yeltsin, immediately started pursuing a foreign policy contrary to that of the West by supporting Milosevic, you remember, in Serbia, less than a year after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when Russia was in ruins, its foreign minister, Andrei Kozyev, whatever, who was considered to be a great liberal, in quotes, had the chutzpah to state in an interview to the Frankfurt uh, newspaper, quote, the language of lecturing is inappropriate in conversation with Moscow. And the West swallowed all of that. It just swallowed it. It deemed Russia as its equal. Then he says, then the, quote, democratic Russia perpetrated the ethnic cleansing of Georgians in Abkhazia, took away Abkhazia from Georgia, and the West allowed Yeltsin to do that and continued to support him, even after the first war in Chechnya, which killed 80,000 people. The West didn't go beyond verbal criticism, didn't subject Russia to any sanction. These are facts, sad and shameful facts. How come that the experience with Hitler almost a century ago has still not taught Western politicians that dictators and murderers should never be appeased? That is worth reading again from Kissin. How come that the experience with Hitler almost a century ago has still not taught Western politicians that dictators and murderers should never be appeased but confronted more decisively and by all possible means? that it is not only the right, but the moral duty of the West to do so. Otherwise, it becomes responsible for the crimes it encourages dictators to perpetrate. When the foreign minister of Putin's Russia dares to say to the British prime minister, who are you to fucking lecture me? The latter should respond, watch your language, sir. I'm the foreign minister of Great Britain, the eldest democracy of the world, a great democratic party, whereas you are an official of a criminal authoritarian regime, and therefore you and your cronies should be grateful that we are only lecturing you and not destroying you. Wow. <laughs> After all the experience of the 20th century, which demonstrated almost most clearly where any deviations from freedom and democracy, communism, Nazism, fascism, uh, clerkalism lead to, does it still need to be explained that the West, with all its faults and imperfections, is the best society on the planet and that 
everybody who dares to oppose it, let alone counter the West, the scared principles of the sacred principles of freedom and democracy is a shit which like every shit deserves only one thing to be flushed down the toilet as quickly as possible so that it would not stink and not spoil good people's lives <laughs> this is a classical musician <laughs> this is brilliant i must say that it became a grave disappointment for me when i realized a number of years ago that the Western principles, the Western ideals, the Western international politics are not the same thing. That most Western politicians for dozens of years have been betraying their own ideals and principles. Another striking example of this is that since the democratic state of Israel has created, opportunistic Western politicians have been forcing their natural ally to make concessions to anti-democratic enemies who have always been determined to destroy him. Now I can only say to them, if you don't do everything to help the brave Ukrainian people to win this war, to drive the aggressors and murderers out of their country, history will never forgive you. Standing ovation. I mean, that is amazing, powerful, true stuff. Now, again, I don't agree with everything. Uh, it, it, not everything is on the same level. But the answer of, <laughs> of, <laughs> of what, the, what the foreign minister of Great Britain should have said to the Russian, <laughs> who are you to lecture me? <laughs> I'm the foreign minister of Great Britain, the oldest democracy in the world, a great democratic party, party where you are an official of a criminal authoritarian regime and therefore you and your cronies should be grateful that we are only lecturing you and not destroying you. I mean, that's, that's what the West needs. That's what it needs. When he writes, after all the experiences of the, of the 20th century, which demonstrated most clearly that any deviation for freedom, communism, Nazism, fascism, Clericalism, which is, uh, 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 um, what do you call it? Uh, anyway, clericalism, that's Iran, lead to, does it still need to be explained that the West, with all its faults and imperfections, is the best society in the planet? And that everybody who dares to oppose it, let alone counter the West, the sacred principles of freedom and democracy is a shit, which like every shit deserves only one thing, to be flushed down the toilet as quickly as possible, so that it would not stink and spoil good people's lives? Oh, God. If we had politicians who understood this, who had the balls, the courage to stand up to the shits of the world, to the authoritarians of the world, to the dictators of the world. It wasn't, by the way, only Churchill who wanted to rid the world of communism after World War II, as General Patton as well who wanted, who was commanding the Allied forces in Europe at the time, and it was obvious while he was in Berlin that he was trying to instigate a war with Russia because he knew, he knew the politicians wouldn't allow it, so he thought that he could maybe get Russia to do something horrible that would force their hand to fight on. But at every opportunity the West has appeased, at every opportunity the West expresses, the fact, this is multiculturalism, that the West is no better. And again, there are libertarians, there are people in this chat who believe that, who think Russia is just another country, who believe that there is no, that the West is no better, that FDR was no better than Stalin, as critical as I am of FDR. He was much better than Stalin, a million light years better than Stalin. Soviet Union was not instrumental in beating the Nazis, and the Soviet Union was as bad as the Nazis. The Soviet Union was not a threat to the United States at that point. Why would you be have an iota, a, a, a drop of sympathy towards the Soviet Union? Well, the United States isn't as great as it once was, but it's greater than anybody else still on the planet. Why... Why any sympathy to Russia? Why any sympathy to the Soviet Union? 
Soviet Union was Nazis. Putin's Russia is a Nazi regime. Maybe not Nazi Nazis, but fascists. So, I, you know, I think that was brilliant. Uh, I am uh, looking forward to going, buying a bunch of music um, played by Yveni Kissin, because I'm sure I enjoy it, but more than that, uh, but also because I want to support him now. I've become a fan, a fan of his, uh, his ability to play the piano, but also now a fan of his intellect, a fan of his passion, a fan of his understanding of, of, of the West and the value that it represents and, and the evil every single alternative out there to the West represents. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one of those uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and, of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.